Welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's special Me Too Monologues Durham Grown. I'm Kari, I'm the director. Um, we want to thank our collaborators, including Artstigators, Duke Arts, the Forum for Scholars and Publics, and DUU. You'll find a list of other collaborators in tonight's <coughs> program. The idea for Durham Grown started last summer as a way to learn more about these two overlapping communities that we inhabit. We realized that some among us have much deeper and more complex relationships with the city of Durham than those of us who have just recently arrived here to attend college or to start our first jobs. So we wanted to create a space to get a conversation started about that experience of seeing Durham and Duke from both sides, inside and outside, over the course of many years. We also want to keep this conversation going, so in addition to the story performances, there are going to be two additional t parts of tonight's program aimed at that goal. First, you'll note that the program has post-it notes. Do you all see them? Yeah, we have the post-it notes. Um, and we are going to, by the end of the night, ask that y'all um, complete the following sentence. My dream for Duke and Durham is, and then you can fill in on your post-it note and place it on that green wall table over there. Yeah, there we go. Excellent, excellent. And so you'll be able to see what other people write and we'll hopefully get sort of a list of some ideas. Um, secondly, you'll note that throughout tonight's performance, our Durham artist, Gabe Ingatz, who's back there. He's gonna be, um, he's, yeah. gonna be he's gonna be doing some sketches actually between the monologues sort of on the, on the projector up here, sort of inspired by the monologues. Um, and that'll be something that we can keep um, from tonight's performance to help continue the conversation. So, uh, one last thing is that, as with any Me Too monologue performance, we want you very much to participate in the, in the show itself, so you can snap along when you feel something that resonates with you. You can go, mm, when you feel something that, like, really, a word that really hits you or an idea that really hits you, so, really, this is all about call and response and about getting audience feedback as well. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Um, enjoy tonight's performance, and glad you're at Durham Drum. Thank you. <laughs> Noteworthy thing until I got to do. 
almost everyone I knew went to public school. That was just what people did, and private school is mostly out of the ordinary. And here, I feel the need to simultaneously defend public school as having given me a great education, and also brag about making it out of public high school. <laughs> Did this change the way I think about things like this? I mean, this changed the way I think about so many things, mostly for the better as I learn more and take classes that genuinely challenge everything I think that I know. But I do know that I'm proud to be from Durham, and that it has a lot to offer, and that it's made me who I am today. And Duke has too, and I'm so thankful to be at Duke to have been born at Duke Hospital and to have this amazing school in the city that I grew up in. As much as the state of North Carolina sometimes disappoints me, I'm never embarrassed to say that I'm from Durham. And as much as I joke about needing to get out of Durham, I'm glad I've spent so many years here. I think Duke would be a much better place if we all got out of our bubble a little more and explored Durham and talked to other Durhamites and heard what they had to say too. It adds a little much needed perspective. And honestly, if you come to love Durham half as much as I do, it'll be well worth the effort. Put on your traveling shoes, folks, because I'm about to take you on a trip back in time. Likely before most of you were born. A time before the existence of the internet or cable TV, or PCs. I'm talking about my freshman year, Duke University, 1973. <laughs> I was a poor kid who grew up in North Carolina. My family moved to Durham when I was in junior high. My father was a minister at one of the big churches downtown, and the congregation was mostly rich, and we were not. A kind high school teacher who liked my mind told me about a little known policy at Duke. Children of the clergy of any faith in Durham County can attend Duke tuition free. Now, don't get any big ideas about running off and joining the clergy now so your kids can come to Duke. The university eliminated that loophole shortly before I graduated. But for me, it meant that going to Duke was cheaper than attending Carolina. I lived in the dorm on West Campus, close to my science class. No one in the dorm had a southern accent, including me. My parents had taken great pains to eliminate their Memphis drawls and made sure that their children spoke flawless, generic American. I had never heard so many Yankee accents in my entire life. Back in my high school, there had been maybe a half dozen Jewish kids, and they were exotically interesting to me at the time, but now I was the exotic one. When they asked me where I was from, and I said Durham, they ridiculed me for staying in my hometown. And their lingo befuddled me daily I once met a girl down the hall who introduced herself as a Jap, and I was confused because she didn't look at all Asian. And, <laughs> I mean, my parents had never used such words to describe someone's ethnicity. It was months later before I realized that she meant Jap as in Jewish American princess. And but Jewish or not, to my poor German upbringing, they all seemed so rich. I mean, they all wore these, you know, these real fur coats when the autumn chills arrived. I was so naive that I thought my classmates would be sitting under trees, discussing big ideas. But really, it was mostly frat boys sitting on quad benches, drinking beer, the legal age was 18 back then, and loudly raiding all of the girls who walked by. I mean, I went miles out of my way to avoid that after the first time when they ridiculed my clothes. All the girls in my dorm wanted to be in sororities and date frat boys. I did not. I would never felt so alone in my life. My sophomore year, my father told me that he couldn't give me any money for food because he was paying for another child in college by then. I got the one job I could find, working 20 hours a week on the ground crew. I, you know, I cut grass, I filled gullies with gravel, I climbed down into window wells to get leaves out, pretty much whatever needed to be done. I had serious muscles before it was fashionable to be fit. And the boys made fun of that too. And my dirty jeans and steel-toed boots. But I carried a full academic load and made decent grades. I never felt so alone in my life. By my junior year, I had learned about work study by, over, by eavesdropping on some other students. And I found a much better paying job, only had to work 12 hours a week. And I actually had time to like dig into my classes, do the extra reading, and really enjoy myself. Most of my professors were brilliant. 
and some were even good teachers. <laughs> but during my four years as an undergraduate, no adult ever asked me how I was faring. No one ever <laughs> offered to help me navigate the complexities of college life. I never felt so alone in my life. I graduated from Laude. I'm 37. I was born here at Duke Hospital, and I've worked here three years. A lot of my friends want to work at Duke because it's Duke. Someone always wants to work at Duke. They just like Duke. Some people look at the basketball team, Coach K. Everybody loves Coach K. I just always wanted to work at Duke. My grandfather worked here. He was a head baker over there on West Campus. My grandmother worked at East Campus. My father worked on grounds. So I always wanted to work at Duke. I just liked Duke. At first, I was a temp, and it was great. I loved my first day. I even called the temp place and told them how much I loved it. It was just laid back. And you know, I have a supervisor over you, and the people was friendly. That's it. I'm close to a lot of workers on the second floor. We share up a lot of our stories together. I haven't had to sit down with a student yet and have a conversation with them. I never have, but they're friendly. The ones I've met are friendly. I don't think students are aware of everything that goes on here in Durham, unless you see it on the news. I think students get out more and go visit different neighborhoods. You know, maybe walk around door to door, do the exact thing you're doing with me. I think that's what can make it better. But right now, with all the violence going on, be careful. I stay out in 70. I stay in a good neighborhood. I surround myself with all different types of people. I met different types of people, white, Korean, all that. It's a lot of violence here in Durham. I mean, it's just a whole lot of killing as far as black males. I think I'm talking about Lawson Street, McDougal Terrence, the old Federal Street projects, the old Few Gardens projects. It's a lot different there. I grew up in Downward Court. I was always in Cornwallis projects. When I was smaller, it wasn't all this stuff going on. You could leave your door unlocked and stuff like that, but now you can't. You always have to watch over your shoulder. Sometimes, say when I'm walking into a convenience store, and if I'm in the bad neighborhood, and if there's some guys out there in a the game, they'd be like, hey, what's up? I don't even want to interact like that. It's a lot different now and then. Now, it's gotten worse. At Duke, there's no respect. The students, I don't think they respect the housekeepers. I'm saying as far as the bathroom and things go like that, I think they should be more big old. Don't go in there and let the water splash all over the floor because at the end of the day, somebody got to clean it up. But I guess that's our job. Please, act like an adult when you go in the restroom because the things I've seen here, it's awful. Still, I'm going to retire here. Good benefits. <laughs> Born in Duke Hospital in 1957 and raised in the Bull City, reluctantly schooled in the then Durham City Public Schools, I knew, and I know, many Durhams. I, I, there was the Durham of my birth. I still have the clipping from the Durham Morning Herald, which lists my name under the white babies section uh, of the birth announcements. Now, while this Durham had a thriving Negro, and that was the term at the time, uh, middle class, a Jewish mayor, and women on the school board, it was still a southern city, steeped in a culture of segregation and, and white privilege. Now, having spent the first five years of my life at the northwestern edge of Durham and the outermost reaches of civilization, uh, which was just off Guess Road, south of Interstate 85, <laughs> there were still homes without plumbing and kids without shoes. Downtown Durham had a vibrancy that would soon be disrupted for decades by the imminent introduction of malls and the urban decay of the late 20th century. But my family moved to Duke Forest as I entered kindergarten. This was a beautiful neighborhood of Duke-affiliated transplants, but woefully walled off from the real Durham and its rich Southern culture. My siblings and I went to Durham City Public Schools, where we caught more than just a glimpse beyond our isolated suburban green zone. Uh, when the schools desegregated in 1970, I was further immersed in Durham culture through the lens of a racial minority status. Uh, junior high school provides plenty of challenges under the easiest of circumstances. But to be small, to be slight of build, and to be a blonde among black, and that was the term at the time, uh, peers during this grand social experiment found an urgent need for coping skills through humor, uh, well-timed occasional outbursts, and occasional invisibility. My next stop was Hillside High School, Durham's historically black secondary school. 
we white students were the interlopers, but of sufficiently small numbers so as not to be much of a threat to the black hegemony. The culture was amazing. There are kids from all across the social culture, lawyers' kids, NCCU professors' kids, bricklayers' kids, even flamboyantly open transvestites, all more or less living together and tolerating this new influx of Caucasian interloper. Still just a hair over five feet, I searched for ways to find acceptance. Um, athletics was a viable means for the bigger, faster, stronger white boys, but <laughs> alas, as my diminutive frame and my giant feet, presaging some future growth uh, it exempted me. Ultimately, though, I found redemption as the lone white member of the baddest funk band in school. <laughs> we played amazing music. We played early P-Funk, Ohio Players, EWF, Brothers Johnson, even a couple of originals that my bandmates let me write. <laughs> Suddenly, my social acceptance skyrocketed. As, as I told last year's bully that, hey, I didn't think he was strong enough to roadie for me. Okay? <laughs> so after Hillside, I got accepted at Duke. But as was my family's expectation, I went away to school to upstate New York. <laughs> While there, I was the exotic Southerner. <laughs> But a family move to Princeton, New Jersey, and a feeling that I'd outgrown the small northern school found me transferring to Duke, back to my Durham roots. Now, expecting the activist and socially outraged hippies of the Duke of my childhood, it was quite a shock to hear the students more outraged about not being able to buy beer on points <laughs> than uh, you know, social injustices around the world. Um, the preppy culture was pervasive. And I strive to be a chameleon, alligator shirt one day, punk rock and cowboy boots the next day. And as a transfer, I was not allowed on campus housing, further declaring me the, the townie going to classes at Duke. Uh, but even as an outsider, which was a recurring theme in my Durham experiences, I love the intellectual culture, the myriad extracurricular opportunities, and the amazing fellow students. Now, I lived in Durham for decades after graduation raising kids, working in nearby RTP, and enjoying the opportunities of our city and our state. In 1999, my wife and I bought three acres outside of Hillsboro on the Eno River. We built a house and moved out at the end of 2001. Upon our departure, Durham quickly decided to blossom and became the cultural mecca that it had always fantasized to be, which we tried not to take personally, although the timing was very hard to ignore. <laughs> He watches Durham becomes one of the 50 places you see before you die in the New York Times alongside Angkor Wat <laughs> and other wonders of the world. We still come into Durham often to enjoy the culture, eat the amazing culinary offerings, and uh, watch Duke basketball. And while we couldn't be happier in our bucolic retreat, our hearts remain forever tethered to the Bull City. And when the time comes to seek a more urban and urbane lifestyle, uh, near world-class medical facilities and amazing cultural options, well, Raleigh, Chapel Hill, Carborough, and most of all, Cary, don't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's fall of my freshman year, and I've just failed my second midterm in Cal 112. I'm desperate for solutions, unsure of what to do, and I really, really don't want to talk to my parents ever again. Of course, just as I'm devising ways to avoid my parents for the rest of my life, my phone rings and, oh shit, it's my mom. So naturally, I deal with it the only way I know how by running away and getting the hell off Duke's campus. I bike erratically down Main Street, tears making me weave into traffic and causing cars to honk at me in disbelief. Who the fuck is this Duke student drunk already? It's only 2 p.m. <laughs> and then it appears. This ugly squat building at the far end of a cracked parking lot next to the hosiery mill. To give the poor cars some relief, I stop outside and see a board detailing the day's specials. Oxtail, turkey neck bones, fresh hush puppies, collards, and candied yams. A huge sign above the door proclaims JC's Kitchen. I was too busy thinking that my life was over to even notice the proprietor edge outside the door and give me the once over. Honey, you need something to eat? 
We make eye contact. I start crying harder. <laughs> Between blubbery sobs and hiccups, I tell her, I'm so sorry, I don't have any money. She puts her hands on her hips, looks at me in the eyes and said, that don't matter, sugar. You pay me back whenever you can. Honestly, baby, it looks like you could use some food. Obviously, I started crying more. <laughs> Later, once I'd gotten inside and was reading Bible verses on the wall, I while chowing down on neck bones on a plastic purple tablecloth, do I realize that JC is Jesus Christ. Sweet, right? <laughs> well, I promise two views of Durham. This one has a lot less Jesus and a whole lot more firearms. <laughs> Fast forward to early July. I'm living and working in Durham and living in a house a block off East Campus. And as I'm falling asleep, my housemate knocks on my bedroom door and says, hey, two big guys just ran into our backyard. And there goes my chance of getting sleep ever again. <laughs> we head downstairs just as 20 cop cars pull into our driveway. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Well, my dumb, dumb ass housemate runs outside and demands to know what's going on. The police chief shouts, get the hell inside, get down and stay quiet. He starts to argue with the cop. <laughs> so I drag him back on inside before quickly gathering my husky, my cat, my flock of quills, and my lizards and going downstairs <laughs> to the center of the room. I pray for my zoo to keep quiet. <laughs> and uh, to keep quiet. And 10 minutes later, we hear gunshots, yelps, and cops shouting, we got it, it's all over. My roommate, like the moron he is, <laughs> runs out the back door despite the fact that the shots had just been fired in her backyard with me behind him just as a cop bends over and picks up a black lump that definitely wasn't there earlier. He smiles and tilts the bag toward me to reveal a trash bag full of guns. Oh, okay. So this is the Durham my mom warned, warned me about. So here we have Jesus' kitchen and a bag of guns. At first glance, we might be tempted to tell our PFROJ and parents about the first scenario and push the second one out of sight. But doing that would really be doing Durham a disservice. I love Durham because of JC's Kitchen, Nights at the Pinhook, and the annual Beaver Queen pageant. Seriously, check it out, it's amazing. <laughs> I also love Durham because of its complicated history, its diversity and its variety, and because Durham's imperfections means it can grow, and Duke can be a part of that growth. As Duke students, it's easy to condemn Durham as sketchy or brag to our family that, no, Durham is perfectly safe now. <laughs> Gang violence was hella a thing in like the 80s. Jeez, get with it, mom. <laughs> but that's not true. Let's celebrate Durham because it's compassionate and welcoming and awesome but never lose sight of where Durham came from and where we can go next. Let's own Durham, all of it, even though sometimes it can be messy and, yeah, kind of scary. It's home for as long as we want it to be. Um, I went to Northern High School in uh, 85. I graduated from the last class of Durham High, which was in 1993. Uh, I've been here for like 20 years. I've been here since 1990. We're husband and wife. Uh, we met here at Duke in 95. In she had just seen me and had to have. <laughs> I was here first and you came in, you know? Uh, it was winter of 95 at the marketplace. Um, I had just started working at Duke. I didn't really say anything. I'd just seen him. I knew I was going to see him again. I approached her first. Yeah. You can tell when someone's looking at you, you know, like they're looking at you and you look back. <laughs> uh, for our first date, we went to see the movie Friday, Friday when, when it first came, came out. out. He was different from everybody else I worked with. Everybody else was young and wanted to party. I didn't want to party. When 
I met him, he didn't want to party every time. I'm a homebody. And now we see each other every day at work, but you know, it's just work. Like, we know what we're here for. Mm -hmm. We got children to feed. Yeah. We got three kids. We got a son, he goes to DSA. We got a daughter, she's 13. We got a little baby, she's three. Most of our kinfolk stay in Durham. All of my family's here. I have three brothers, all work for Duke. Uh, I had a brother who used to work here. There's a, there's a whole lot of people in Durham who actually work at Duke. It's hard to walk around Durham and not see something that Duke's in it on. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we live near Duke Regional. Uh, it's not that far away from Duke. It's about a 10 minute drive. Uh, I think Durham's a great place to live. You know, it's got a lot going on downtown right now. You know, they got d -pack. There's a lot going on downtown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's got its ups, you know, it's got its downs. But there's a lot more upside than downside. Most of the time when we're off, we just kind of relax at home. I'm a homebody, she's a homebody. You don't see too many Duke students outside of Durham. Uh, outside these walls. Unless it's like at the mall or something like that. You know, very seldom you see them anywhere else. I mean, I guess they go to Chapel Hill. You know, it's more of a college town. They also go downtown, Bright Leaf, 9th Street, Chapel Road. Oh, story. Uh, one of the basketball <laughs> players, Shane Battier, uh, when he went here, he was like real friendly, connected real good with all the employees and staff. Uh, so then there's this other guy who comes here who goes, uh, he teaches tip classes. He took the tip classes, went to U Miami. Uh, he was a professor. Long story short, he's also a ticket holder with the Miami Heat, so he knows the owner, the guy with the cruise ship line. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, last summer, or this summer, uh, the Miami Heat were in the championship playoffs with the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, he said Shane asked him to get a picture of us for inspiration and motivation. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. You know, even though Shane's been gone for 10, 15 years, he still asked us for a photograph. You know, so I sent him a photograph that we, we took with him when he was here. Uh, uh, it's been a while, but he never forgot about us. I thought that was pretty cool.